Hello everyone, and welcome to DE Classified, a podcast showcasing the history of destroyer escorts. Each month, a member of the USS Slater's education crew will highlight a specific destroyer escort and share the stories of the sailors who served aboard these trim but deadly ships. I'm Austin Snyder, longest-running intern tour guide here at the USS Slater, and today we're going to be talking about the USS Buckley, DE-51. The Buckley was the lead ship of the Buckley-class destroyer escorts. The Buckley-class, being the second class of DEs to be designed by the US Navy, mostly went about attempting to fix many of the major design limitations and inconveniences of the preceding Everts class. The biggest improvement provided by the Buckleys were their lengthened hulls, which were a noticeable 17 feet longer than that of their Everts counterparts. This brought the Buckleys hull length up to 306 feet. This allowed for the more logical interior compartment organization, as well as more convenient hardpoint placement. This longer hull proved so popular and successful that all succeeding destroyer escort classes, of which there would be another four, utilized it over the Everts short hull. The reason for this lengthened hull was the Buckley sported a slightly more powerful steam turbine propulsion, which required more space. This steam turbine propulsion allowed them to reasonably outpace any Everts-class ship. And this higher speed is what prompted the Navy to redesignate a large number of Buckleys as high-speed transports, or APDs. There were also countless other smaller improvements made to the uh, class's armament, sensors, complement, and so on. Uh, But onto the Buckley herself, uh, her keel was laid by the Bethlehem Hingham Shipyard in Hingham, Massachusetts on June 29th, 1942. And she was launched about six months later on January 9th, 1943. Like all destroyer escorts, the Buckley's namesake was that of a fallen sailor, in this case being aviation ordinanceman John D. Buckley, who was tragically killed during the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. It would be John's mother, who christened the ship during her commissioning ceremony on April 30th, 1943, with Lieutenant Commander A.W. Sladen, U.S. Naval Reserve, in command. During the first year of her service, the Buckley settled into a life of routine, uh, operating as a training ship for prospective officers and participating in several naval exercises up and down the east coast of the United States. Little did her crew know the fame their ship would earn the following year. Upon cessation of her duties as a training ship, the Buckley received a new commanding officer in Lieutenant Commander Brent M. Abel, U.S. Naval Reserve, of Cambridge, Massachusetts. On April 22, 1944, the Buckley was assigned to Hunter Killer Task Group 2111 and departed the U.S. along with the USS Block Island, CVE-21, as well as three other destroyer escorts to patrol the Central Atlantic convoy routes for German U-boats. On May 5th, 1944, reconnaissance aircraft from the, the Block Island located a disappearing radar contact and alerted the group. Unknown to Task Group 2111 at the time, uh, this was the German submarine U-66. U-66 had already been responsible for the sinking of 33 Allied merchant ships for a total loss of 200,000 21 tons of shipping, uh, making her the seventh uh, most successful U-boat of World War II. U-66 was a Type 9C U-boat. Designed in the mid-30s as large ocean-going U-boats, they were derived from earlier, smaller ocean-going variants. Diving depth was designated as 100 meters operational and 200 meters crush depth, although many boats went much deeper and survived. Fitted with six torpedo tubes below the waterline, four at the bow, two at the stern, They had carried 22 total torpedoes. 
U-66 was launched October 10th, 1940 at AG Wesser Shipyard in Bremen, Germany. She had a total of four captains over her lifetime, but we are only concerned with the final, Ober Lieutenant Gerhard Seehausen, who commanded the sub in her final moments. U-66 had completed nine wartime patrols for the Kriegsmarine, uh, racking up an impressive 33 merchantmen sunk and an additional four ships damaged, including two British torpedo boats which struck mines laid by U-66. She was on her 10th patrol when she had encountered the USS Buckley. Now, U-66 was loitering west of Cape Verde, uh, awaiting a rendezvous with a resupply sub, or a milk cow, as the allies called them. What U-66 did not realize, however, was the supply sub she had been awaiting, U-488, had been sunk the week prior by the destroyer escorts USS Frost, Hughes, Barber, and Snowden. Alerted to the presence of the sub, the Block Island dispatched the Buckley at 2120, 2120 hours, to engage her. The DE steamed towards the target with all speed for the next several hours. From here onwards, many things happened very quickly. I'll try my best to keep events in an easy to follow chronological order. It is now May 6th at 0216 hours, a TBF Avenger aircraft reports that U-66 is 20 miles from the Buckley, and the Buckley continues to close the distance, trying to keep the sub between itself and the moon, thereby obscuring the Buckley in the darkness. 30 minutes later, the Buckley picks up the sub on radar at a range of 14,000 yards, or about 12.8 kilometers, and goes to general quarters one minute later. With the Buckley quickly bearing down on the sub, Captain Abel orders all gun mounts to hold fire and to stream Foxer gear at 0300. Foxer gear is successfully streamed a couple minutes later. And at 0306, U-66, in a confusing move, launches a series of red flares which cut through the night and illuminate the sub. The reason for this is unknown. Perhaps the sub mistook the Buckley as the resupply sub she had been waiting for. Or maybe it spotted the aircraft that had been continuously circling overhead much of the night. Whatever the reason, Captain Abel was determined to get as close as possible before firing, and refused to let the guns fire just yet. Nine minutes later, at 0317, Watchmen aboard the Buckley reported seeing a torpedo wake off the port side of the ship, but the bridge made no mention of it in Captain Abel's report. Uh, Captain Abel at this point knows the gig is up and at 0319 hours orders the ship to alter course to avoid th further torpedoes and orders the guns be loaded. Now, it's over the next 19 minutes that the USS Buckley gains all her fame, so blink and you'll miss it. Promptly at 0320, Captain Abel gives the open fire order. Then, at a distance of 2100 yards, or 1.9 kilometers, the two forward 3-inch guns on the Buckley score immediate, direct hits on the sub's forward end. Immediately following that, all mounts that could bear on the target begin rapid fire, including the ship's anti-aircraft weapons, which are now definitely in range. At this point, the Buckley is still quickly approaching the sub, and the U-66 powers up her engines to try and run. The Buckley gives chase, however, and pulls up alongside the port of side of the sub. By 0325, the Buckley and U-66 were running parallel a mere 20 yards apart exchanging gunfire the whole way. At 0329, Captain Abel gives the order to turn hard to starboard. Complying with the captain's orders, the helmsman of the Buckley spins the ship's helm to the right, bringing the two combatants closer and closer together. Seconds later, the Buckley's forecastle crashes into the sub, throwing sailors from both vessels onto their respective decks. Abel then utters an order that had not been heard in the U.S. Navy since 1814. 
stand by to repel borders. Sure enough, the German subcrew, fearing the Americans were going to board their sub, decided to beat them to the punch, and a handful of them climbed up onto the Buckley's forecastle by the number one gun. The German crew had a very real fear that the Americans would attempt a boarding action, as a handful of U-boats had been captured by the Royal Navy in the preceding months and years before this event. Boarding was seen as an extremely high-risk, high-reward action by the Allies. Before abandoning ship, German crews would place scuttling charges on timers to destroy the sub once the crew were off. This was to protect the sensitive naval code materials and the infrastructure to encrypt and decrypt Kriegsmarine orders. All it took were those scuttling charges to detonate, or for the U-boat to succumb to damage sustained during the previous battle, to send the boarding party on the sub to a watery grave. But the reward was enticing to the Allied powers. The more access they had to German coding equipment, the more German orders they could decrypt, and the more they could find out about German encryption. Just a few short months earlier, the Canadian ship, uh, I apologize if I butcher this pronunciation, HMCS Chilliwack, had boarded the U-744 and taken most of her code materials. And the following month, in June 1944, the month after the Buckley's attack, the U-505 was entirely captured by the U.S. Navy. And she is now a museum ship in Chicago, should you ever want to go see a German U-boat in America. So you could see why the Germans were so keen to keep the Allies off their subs. Now, back to the Buckley's battle. Tooth and nail battle. Armed only with what they had around them, the Buckley's forward 3-inch gun crew defended themselves and the ship with coffee mugs, helmets, spent casings, sometimes just their bare fists. Officers on board who had their sidearms would employ those, as well as the chief damage controlman who was stationed up on the bridge with the captain, uh, had a Thompson submachine gun, which we would occasionally uh, spray bouts of, of bullets down onto the conning tower of the sub to dissuade any further Germans from exiting the sub to attempt to board. The brawl only lasted for about a minute, as Captain Abel had no intention of letting any more German submariners aboard his ship, and he ordered the engines be slowed to allow the sub to free itself from the Buckley. The few German boarders that remained on the Buckley were escorted beneath decks by a man wielding a hammer. And the battle continued, as the sub was still operable. The Buckley easily caught back up to the fleeing sub by 0333, when the sub, seemingly out of control, ran into the Buckley. Now with the sub again wedged up against the ship, a sailor on board the Buckley dropped two fragmentation grenades into the sub's conning tower. U-66, now aflame and severely damaged, slipped beneath the waves at 0336, and an underwater explosion was recorded by the Buckley's sonar operator at 0339. U-66 was confirmed sunk. Again. To reiterate this, everything I just said about the Buckley's battle with U-66 happened over the course of 19 minutes. But this, the Buckley was not done in the area. Over the course of the next three hours, the Buckley had scoured the area looking for German survivors. Of the sub's full complement of 48, she was successful in picking up 36 of them. They were taken aboard and quickly transferred to the Block Island, where they were given dry clothes, food, and cigarettes. The prisoners uh, eventually were taken to Casablanca, where they would be kept under Navy supervision, and the Block Island would leave for her final journey, as she would be torpedoed off the Canary Islands a couple weeks later, being the only aircraft carrier to be sunk during the Battle of the Atlantic. Records following the battle indicate that the USS Buckley had expended 105 3-inch shells, 3,118 20 and 40 millimeter shells, 
390 rounds of small arms ammunition, two fragmentation grenades, and, quote, a large number of improvised weapons, inclu unquote, including shell casings, coffee mugs, and hammers. The Buckley had come out on top of, from her encounter with U-66, but she was far from undamaged. Destroyer escort hulls were notoriously thin, and the two rams the Buckley had sustained had left quite the marks on her. Her bow was significantly bent as a result of the first ram. Also, her starboard propeller shaft was sheared off, and there were many breaches into the ship's engine rooms and laundry room from the subs scraping against her side. Despite all of this, after uh, quick temporary repairs, the ship was able to make it back to Boston under her own power to receive more permanent repair work. The Buckley's duel with U-66 was quite the story amongst naval personnel at the time. Several high Navy officer, naval officers uh, called it, quote, the most exciting submarine kill, unquote. The crew of the Buckley were authorized to wear the combat star in the European African theater ribbon, and Captain Abel was awarded the Navy Cross for his leadership skill in sinking a submarine under such circumstances and not having a single casualty on board his ship. The remainder of Buckley's service was much more conventional, let's say. The ship would take part in another three convoy escort missions. On April 19, 1945, she sank the German sub U-548 with the assistance of USS Reuben James, although the sub was thought to be U-879 at the time. Buckley's attack on U-548 was officially analyzed as excellent. The critique read, quote, Buckley slowed to five knots and waited until contact was gained also by Reuben James before commencing the run on the U-boat. This was a safe speed to counter the possibility of acoustic torpedoes, and at the same time the U-boat was apparently not alerted, as evidenced by lack of evasive maneuvers." Unquote. Another sub sunk, with no casualties on the Buckley's end. By the end of World War II, the USS Buckley had managed to accumulate a Navy unit commendation along with three battle stars. Following World War II, the USS Buckley was converted into a radar picket ship, or DER. These ships received state-of-the-art radar equipment, and they served as essentially a floating radar station. Uh, she was officially classified as DER-51 on April 26th, 1949, only to be stripped back down and reclassified as DE-51 on September 29th, 1954, uh, five years later. The Buckley would remain on the Naval uh, Vessel Register until she was stricken on June 1st, 1968, and eventually sold for scrap the following year. Thank you for listening to DE Classified. This podcast is brought to you by the Destroyer Escort Historical Museum aboard USS Slater. You can find a transcript of this episode, accompanying photos, and a bibliography at ussslater.org slash declassified. I'm Austin Snyder, and I hope you join us next month to DE Classify the USS Eldridge.